out this afternoon. Uh, this is the first time we've ever done an afternoon event like this uh, here in the town hall. So interesting to see. We've got a pretty good number. Appreciate you coming. It was uh, scheduled earlier in the year, but we had some severe storms and potential flooding that particular day, and so we moved it to today. And we uh, are looking forward to it. This is a, a program sponsored both by the Worcester Historical Society and the Vermont Humanities Council. So it's through their Speakers Bureau program that we are able to present programs like this. Uh, this, this particular presenter is a very reputable person. <laughs> she has uh, come to us yeah. via Minnesota, or well, right. <laughs> but I think she said she's been here for about 60 years, which must have meant that she... Well, no, I left Minnesota that long ago. Okay, that long ago. Uh, okay, you've been here longer than 60 years. No, I've been here like 40. I've been in Vermont 40. since 1984. Okay, good enough. That's good enough. That makes you a Vermont. Oh, I don't think so, but okay. Well, I know so. I know so. Nice try. Thank you. She is the former uh, executive director of Barkaby Rokeby from the Rokeby Museum. Uh, how many of you been to Rokeby? Good. Most well, of us have been there. Thank you. And we are looking forward to her presentation today. So welcome Jane Williamson. All right. I'm trying to decide if I should, what side I should have it on. Okay. If I'm a little jittery, you'll give me a pat, right? Of course. So thank you for inviting me, and I always have to thank the Vermont Humanities Council because their wonderful Speakers Bureau makes this all possible. They just give us a grant. Be even well, <laughs> I've been there, honey, I know. They're, they're tough. They can be very tough. They funded this project at least once, if not twice. Um, so this talk um, today explores um, one story of the Underground Railroad in Vermont. It focuses on, let's see if I can do this, Ropey. Can you all see, am I standing in a bad it's place? It's fine, it's fine. Okay, focuses on Ropey, uh, home of the abolitionist Robinson family. And they sheltered dozens of fugitives from slavery in the 1830s and 1840s. And specifically, my focus is on Jesse, who found his way to Ropey um, in 1836, and about whom we have been able to learn quite a bit under the circumstances of how much you can find out about people who were born enslaved. Um, my talk builds on research that I did over many years for Free and Safe, an exhibit exploring the Underground Railroad in Vermont and at Ropey specifically. Yeah, I just got started, come on in. Um, and so it presents the story of one man's search for freedom and how we discovered it and how it all came together. Um, now, bringing enslaved people to life, because they tend to be ciphers, um, was a major goal of Free and Safe, and um, <clears throat> including Jesse. And we focused on two of the fugitives who were sheltered at Ropey, Jesse and Simon. Jesse was one of thousands who risked their lives by escaping to the north or to Canada in, to claim their freedom in the years before the Civil War. Jesse was one of anonymous millions and he would have remained anonymous, except for a few pieces of paper and a Vermont family's propensity to save. Yes, savers. Hats off to savers. Don't let them dissuade you. <laughs> so we started with three letters in the collection at Rope B, and we, from that we were able to reclaim Jesse's life, or at least some of it, just one, one piece of it. Um, and that's what I'm gonna share with you tonight. Now, Jesse's story begins in Perquimans County, North Carolina. There it is, it's that yellow, it's way over on the Atlantic, practically on the Atlantic coast. And it stops in Ferrisburg, Vermont. So I wish I, I should have one map with both of them so you can see what a huge distance that is. Mm -hmm. Jesse's story does not end in Ferrisburg, but it stops there because that is where his trail goes cold. We could not find him after he left. He was born enslaved in the household of Joseph Elliott around 1810, and he freed himself by escaping. Somehow he made his way to Ropeby, a sheep farm in northeast western Vermont owned by the Quaker Robinsons. And I should just say, I should have said this when I had the 
picture of the fellow on. That little et, uh, um, woodcut of the fellow sitting down, that is a fugitive slave. It was, it was drawn from life, published in the um, Harper's Weekly during the Civil War. It's not Jesse. I found that image early on in my research, and I loved it, and I kept it. And I'm illustrating this talk with generic photographs. That wasn't Jesse. I'm going to show you other pictures. But they're here to illustrate. They suggest what it is. They illustrate what I'm telling you without actually being the folks. OK, so the Elliott family of Perquimans County, where Jesse was born. Joseph Elliott lived with his wife and children on holdings. And that's for Quimmins. It's quite small. I drove the whole thing in a day, and they were sort of in the upper corner. Um, that had been in his family since at least 1714. He owned 267 acres in an area where 200 acres was a considerably large, considered a large farm. And many of his neighbors had no land at all. But his land was not good. It was poor, swampy, and valued at only $2.34 an acre. And that swampy part, you know, it's a lot of swamp in this county. His land, though, was adequate to raise hogs and corn, um, which were the dietary staples for North Carolinians enslaved and free throughout the 19th century. <clears throat> Joseph Elliott's will, for example, counted more than 50 hogs in his estate. Although comfortable, hogs, hogs pigs, hogs. sows, hogs, okay. yes. Sorry, this is my Minnesota accent. It's all right, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a little bit of it still. Um, I think I'm, it's walls. I, I don't have any accent. He, yeah, so no, you don't at all. <laughs> um, although comfortable, the Elliots were not in the class of elite planters when we think of. When we think of, you know, southern people who had enslaved laborers, we, they lived in fancy mansions. That stereotype of the southern plantation. Well, you can just put that aside. It does not apply here. They did not live in a columned mansion like this one, nor did they own hundreds of enslaved productive acres worked by gangs of enslaved workers. Very few, in, in fact, in North Carolina did. Um, Quimmins County did have its you know, so-called plantations, although they were extremely modest by the standards of Virginia or the deep cotton south. That's Cove Grove. That was built in Perquimans County around 1830. Now, historians define a plantation as a holding with at least 20 enslaved laborers. And by that standard, Perquimans had 24 plantations in 1820. But the largest one had only 44 slaves, compared with hundreds in these large, southern, much deeper south plantations. James Lee and James Wedby were the two wealthiest men in the county. Wedby had 44 enslaved laborers, and Lee had 39. James Lee built Land's End. Oops, that was Land's End. Well, I can't go back, sorry. That was Land's End <laughs> in the early 1830s. Now, Joseph Elliott's house um, has not survived. I, at least I couldn't find it. Um, but it was probably very similar to this. This is the Sutton Newby house. This is an early 18th century dwelling that was expanded several times and is the most common house type in the region. If you travel around that part of North Carolina, you just see many of these coastal cottages, we call them. Joseph Elliott's ancestors, interestingly, were Quakers. There was a big Quaker area in Perquimans and past Patunk and some of the surrounding counties. His grandfather, Caleb, to, uh, freed two elderly slaves when he died but he passed others on to his heirs. And this is, uh, you're not going to, be able to read that. This is his um, copy of his will. I would like to read to you. Uh, I, let's see, oh, it's up at the top. Well, he freed his old, old slaves, Kutina and Janie. You can imagine they were well past the age of productive labor, so free them. Those that were still able to work were passed on to his children and grandchildren. But um, the North Carolina Yearly Meeting, that's the head of the Quakers in the state, had decreed in 1776 that friends could no longer keep people enslaved, and it began disowning those who did not comply. So when Caleb passed these people down to his heirs, he broke his family's tie to, the, to their religion. 
uh, both were disowned. Joseph and um, Caleb and Joseph both were disowned, um, as was Joseph's mother. And, and disowned is the Quaker word for excommunicated. It's the religious society of friends. You are a member of the religious society, and if you break certain rules, you may no longer keep your membership. It's basically the way it works. Now, the Elliott family grew considerably during the 15 years after Joseph and Jemima were married. Jemima Elliott had three children before she died, and Joseph's second wife had four more. But the greatest increase was among the enslaved members of the household. Oh, gosh, you can't see this either. Oh, right. well, this is the division of the Negroes of Solomon Elliott. On the 1820 census listed a total of 13 slaves. Oh, I think I'm in the wrong picture. No? Yes, I am. <clears throat> the 1820 census listed a total of 13 slaves, two adult men, two adult women, and six boys and three girls, all under the age of 14. Luke had found a wife. Did I skip a whole page? Sorry. Uh, Luke had found a wife, Cherry, and Rose a husband, and the two couples were presumably parents of these nine children. Joseph had obviously prospered enough to purchase Cherry, and she and Luke were fortunate to live in the same household where they could raise their children together. Rose's husband does not appear in the Elliott family documents and may have been enslaved in another household. But here is the pertinent fact. Rose's children belonged to Joseph Elliott, and so did those of Luke and Cherry. By the simple act of having children, these slaves ensured the Elliott's wealth. Now, disaster struck in 1824. Joseph Elliott died, unexpectedly, apparently, as he had not prepared a will. This must have been a huge blow to his widow, who had seven minor children to care for. But it was far more calamitous for the enslaved members of the household. Their value as workers was now critical, as they would be hired out, children and all, to earn the money that would support Mrs. Elliott and her children. She would keep her children with her, living in the family's home. Luke, Cherry, Rose, and their children would be scattered, sent to households wherever their labor could command a wage. Eventually, Joseph Elliott's property, including his human property, was divided among his heirs. This is Moses Roper, who escaped from slavery in North Carolina and went on to publish an autobiography in 1837. He explained how the enslaved were divided by drawing lots. He wrote, quote, the way they divide their slaves is this. They write the names of different slaves on a small piece of paper and put it into a box and then let them all draw. This was the standard practice in North Carolina at the time. And here you see how it worked. Again, I wish this was more visible. Again, this, is, this division of the Negroes is a very common document in the South when someone died and there was a probate. So th these are large pieces of paper. Um, the little red is wax. There, there were half a dozen or 10 of these large pieces of paper in one folder. And I think they had all been tacked together with wax into some kind of configuration. But they'd all come apart. And I wish you could see this because on this side, on the, can we, can we focus it a little bit back out? Can that help? Not really. All right, well, um, on the left are the lots. One, two, three, four, five. Lot number four says, boy Jesse and old Luke's wife, Cherry. And if you can believe this, there's a little bit of a crease going right through the words, boy, Jesse. So when I'm sitting, this, is, this document is held by the North Carolina State Archives. I'm in there at the Dagnum reading room, going through. And I see this, and I kind of pull this apart. And I, go, ah! I really wanted to just shriek. But I don't think you're supposed to shriek in the reading room. <laughs> <laughs> So I sort of looked around, hoping somebody would look at me and I could go. I just had to hold it in. And then on the other side 
are, is the list one, two, three, four lots drawn by. So you can see that lot number four on this side, Jesse and Cherry, is drawn on the other side by Ephraim, one of the children of Joseph. All right. <clears throat> it said boy Jesse. Um, I'm going to explain this later, but I'll do it now. You'll see these terms boy or man, or I don't think they say girl or woman so much, but um, age was important because of the taxes, and we're going to get to a tax list in a minute. Um, enslaved workers who were too young to be really productive workers were not taxed. And then older people who were too old and you know not really capable of a hard work were also not taxed. So the age matters. So, so this is obviously, I think at this time, Jesse was probably younger than 14. 14 would probably be getting into the age group um, where he might be considered taxable. But at this point, he's still considered taxed. All right. Um, so what happened was um, the enslaved workers were hired out, and tallies of the wages they earned were recorded year by year. And here's one. They were all on these slightly little scraps of paper. I was really surprised that this wasn't done in a very official account book sort of way. But you can see, this one you can see. You see at the top, it says, man, Jesse? Mm -hmm. That's Jesse. He is now a man. This is 1831. Um, he had come of age by 1831. He may have, I, we don't know when he was born. We know about like within two years. So he turned 21 that year or a year or two before. And does it say, I can't read what he, um, how much he earned. All right. Um, he's not on the tally. Do I have the next one? He's not on the tally for 1830. Is this 1831? He's not on the tally for 1832 um, because by then he had gone to live with young Ephraim. Oh, there's another, there's 1832. You can see it's Moses, Luke, Sally, Pleasant, Joseph, Rhody. He's not on that list. Um, El Ephraim, young Ephraim, who had chosen Je Jesse by lot, had also come of age and was now living on the land that he inherited, and he inherited Jesse. So that's what they were, where he was. Okay. Now, unfortunately, you can't see this. This is um, the list of taxables. Ephraim is down near the bottom. It's, it's not in focus, so I'll just tell you. Um, he had 75 acres, um, small plot of land worth $150. And there was a poll tax. So there's a column for a white poll, an able-bodied worker, 20 years old one years or, old, or older, and a, and a black hole. That, it's called a black hole, but it's an enslaved person pretty much exclusively. Um, and you, there'll be a check mark. And there is a check mark in, under both the white pole and the black pole. So they're on Ephraim's land, and Jesse is there with him. Now we have nothing. We know, there's no, found no information about their life together. It wasn't very long. Um, so we just have to sort of wonder what their life was like. Um, we can imagine a few possibilities. Now, um, we do know that Ephraim was unmarried. He married later. Um, so I, my first thought was, well, who's doing all the cooking and the washing and keeping the house? If we remember that Cherry, old Luke's wife Cherry, was also in that lot, it's possible she was there. She wouldn't have shown up on the poll list, though, because she was too old. Or maybe she had died or Maybe the two men were fending for themselves. Maybe Jesse was doing all of the household work, but you can be sure that the two young men were working together, were working on um, Ephraim's land, growing that corn and those hogs, right? And they probably worked side by side in this because Ephraim was not a wealthy man. Um, <clears throat> I, we, as I said, we don't know exactly what year Jesse was born, but we do know that he and Ephraim were at most about two years apart. And they had known each other since childhood. They grew up together. And, and it seems they had a close relationship. It was common in the South for enslaved black and free white children to play together, and sometimes even form strong friendships. 
And these friendships could last a lifetime, but typically until adolescence. That is when the adults, the parents, the guardians, whoever they were in the household, would interfere and make sure that young white children learned how to treat their former playmates as property. It was a real moment of white kids had to learn what the relationship was and what the relationship was going to be. The next week thing we can be sure of is that Jesse ran away. Presumably in 1835, as he disappeared from the 1836 list of taxables. Oh, and by the way, a list of taxables is a grand list. We, what we call a grand list. It's your property, your house, your land, your enslaved workers, and, and well, you should check it all over, and then at the end there's how much tax you owe. We will probably never know, in fact, I'm sure we will never know, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure, um, why Jesse took this move, <laughs> made this step. Um, it's, not, it's not easy, it's, not, it's a little bit dangerous. I mean, certainly all slaves wished for freedom, but very few uh, took that step. Um, how is also a question that we will probably not ever find the answer to, but I think Jesse may have been able to stow away on a ship. His location in coastal North Carolina certainly made it feasible, as you see here. This is the Perquimans River at the mouth of Albemarle Sound. He was right, there was regular ship traffic in and out every day, every week. Um, so boating was everything. I mean, everybody had a boat. Um, that would have been the fastest way for him to reach a free state, and they're sort of the most direct, as long as you don't get caught. This is Harriet Jacobs. Um, she lived just about 10 miles away in Edenton, North Carolina, maybe even only eight miles away. Um, and she also decided that she was going to emancipate herself, and she did get to the north on a ship, as did her older brother, Jacob. So I just offer that as evidence that this is not some crazy idea that I cooked up. It was possible. She actually went on to write an autobiography that's one of the best uh, Fugitive the Slave Narratives. It's a really, really good book. So that is her actual photograph? That is her actual photograph. That's Harriet Jacobs. Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. It's one of the few written by women, and it's, it's an incredible book. It's, she had an amazing life. She really did. Okay, but what we do know is that somehow, why or how, we don't know, but he made his way to Ferrisburg, Vermont in 1836. And these are the Robinsons. This is Rowland and Rachel, uh, the head of household at Ropeby. Um, they sheltered him. He lived and worked on their sheep farm. They were prosperous sheep farmers. We know that he had begun to work for the Robinsons by early 1836 because by March of 1837, he had saved $150. It would take a year to earn $150 if you were working as a farm laborer in Vermont at that time. This was the first time Jesse would have been paid for his work. And just think a minute what it must have felt like for him to have that money in his hand when he was hired out, money changed hands, but it didn't come to him. He did the work, and somebody else got the payment. And this is another one of these images that I found early on. Um, this, this is in Harper's, yeah. This is, this is engraved from life, and the title of this image is Sheep Farming in Vermont. And when I saw this black man in the middle of the picture, it was another one of those whoop occasions, because it just what I needed, right? <laughs> Now, in March of 1837, Jesse asked Rowland Robinson to write a letter for him. It was addressed to Ephraim Elliott in Perquimans County, and it offered him $150 that Jesse had saved up in exchange for a manumission paper. Manumission is legal freedom. This is an example of what Jesse was trying to get. This um, is an ancestor of Ephraim's James Elliott uh, the county of Perquimans, uh, free my Negro woman, patience. He's free and slave. This is, this, is this, is, this is worth $150 to Jesse. No copy of that first letter that Robinson sent to Ephraim Elliott has survived, or at least not that we know of. Um, but we do have Ephraim Elliott's reply. You may be surprised to learn that Ephraim's first reaction 
was not to come after Jesse. This is what he wrote, quote, your letter of 12 March is before me in regard to my Negro Jesse. His situation at this time places it in his power to give me what he thinks proper. But I do not feel disposed to make any title for him for less than $300, mm -hmm. which is not more than one third what I could have had for him if I had been disposed to sell him before he absconded. But I have never had any such intention. I should like for him to return to North Carolina if he should think proper. He may be assured that I will not sell him, but I cannot expect it as he at this time is entirely out of my reach and may not wish to place himself in my power again. Really, right? I never intended that he, sh this is a classic slave owner letter, it's wonderful. I never intended that he should be made a slave not longer than three or four years from the time he left. <clears throat> Jesse was a man that I had a great regard for, that I am hopes will do well. I should like to hear from him from time to time. If he should be disposed to give me the above sum, he can forward the money to someone with instructions to take a bill of sale. It's so interesting because on the one hand, he admits his feelings for Jesse, but then really wants to recoup his money, basically. Um, and of course, he knows exactly where Jesse is because this letter came from Rowan Robinson at the month. So you can imagine Jesse's disappointment, right? He knew Ephraim, but as well as he knew Ephraim, he had miscalculated. <coughs> Jesse had been Ephraim's most valuable possession by far, and he was not prepared to let him go cheap. But Jesse was also determined, and he asked Rowan Robinson to write again. Ta-da! He saved a copy of his letter. It's actually on the back. He turned the letter over. Rowan sat in the, of Ephraim Elliott's letter and penned this, and then made another copy of it, obviously. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, where am I? Okay, so he is um, urging Ephraim even more to say, come on, buddy. So this is what he wrote. Thy letter of the 19th was received last evening, and I regret to find that the sum thou requires for the freedom of Jesse places this desirable object, the most anxious wish of his heart, beyond his reach. Since leaving thy service, he has, by his industry and economy, laid up $150, and he is willing to give the whole of this sum for his freedom. And the whole of the savings is all that he can offer. For much as I and his other friends here may desire his liberty, I am bound to inform thee, without the least wish to offend, that we cannot conscientiously contribute anything toward the purchase of a slave, even for his liberation, because we believe it would be recognizing a principle which God forbids. If Jesse was in possession of a larger sum, he would freely offer it all for his freedom. I therefore hope thou wilt feel disposed to consider the case of one for whom, the, for whom thou hast so great a regard and accept this offer, which, according to his, considering his present circumstances and location, must be acknowledged liberal. Now, there's a critical sentence here that suggests Jesse's options are disappearing. When Robinson wrote that, quote, we cannot conscientiously contribute anything toward the purchase of a slave, even for his liberation, a door is closing. Rowan and Ro Rowan Robinson was a prosperous sheep farmer. He could easily spare the $150 that Jesse needed. But the same religious principles that told him slavery was a sin, kept him from providing this one thing Jesse needed most. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, Ephraim Elliot's pride and sense of entitlement kept him from lowering his price. Ephraim's second letter arrived in June. He wrote, quote, I received thy acceptable letter. I must inform thee that I do not feel disposed to take any less than I stated before. I don't know how Jesse could, with clear conscience, 
wish me to take any less. If Jesse has a desire to come back, I wish he would express his designs in another letter, stating his determinations. If he feels disposed to come back, I will meet him at any place that he will mention, and no sum of money or no temptation shall separate us. But if he does not wish to return, I will make the transfer for the sum before stated. Now what? Jesse is caught between these two extremely different men. Yet what difference does it make to him that they are on opposite sides of the great slavery debate of the 19th century? Neither one is willing to give him that last leg up to real freedom. Ephraim Elliott clings to the fantasy that Jesse will return and amazingly criticizes him for offering such a small sum. <laughs> Rowland Robinson allows the same beliefs that tell him slavery is a sin to keep him from an act of simple but inestimable charity. And Jesse remains a fugitive. He has reached the relative safety of Vermont, but he is still less than fully free. So, that's the story. Anyone have any questions? Could you, could you uh, restate how much um, Ephraim Elliott said Jesse was actually worth to him? He said um, the $300 was one third what he could have had for him. Okay. Um, so that's 900. And he could, you know, on the southern slave market, nine, 900 is extremely believable. Um, you know, uh, so, some very valuable workers were sold for as much as 1,500. You know, so there was 900 to, you know, in the mid 1,000, 1,000, whatever. It was a very typical price. And, and you know, the land, it's, the 75 acres of land here was, well, it was earlier, but in 1831, it was, it was valued at, $150. So you can see how valuable what a, and um, he, he, his insistence that he wasn't going to sell three or four times, he says it in the one letter, makes you think that Jesse was really worried it was going to be sold south. And yeah. that was a point of um, decision making for Manny Simon, who was another uh, fugitive uh, sheltered at Rothby, moved, came north because he had been sold south. If you are going to be forced away from your home and your family and every person and everything you have ever known, you might as well take the risk of running north as you know, the certainty of ending up in Louisiana. Yes? Were there Quakers? You said there were a lot of Quakers in that. Yes, there were. Were they involved in underground railroad? That I can't answer. Um, I couldn't really identify anybody there. Were the folks that they had ended up? You know, the fact that the Robinsons were Quakers and there were Quakers there, I couldn't make any connections. There's a very good collection at, um, oh, it starts with G. You know how you can't remember the word, but you know what letter it starts with? Yeah. Um, it's in Greensboro, North Carolina. Yes. What? That's where Gilford College. Guilford College. They have an excellent uh, Southern Quaker uh, collection. I, I was there too. I big research trip down there. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't, the, the Quakers, you know, they're so fabulous because they were so orderly and they have all these minutes, all these minutes of every meeting and they wrote everything down. But a lot of the side stuff, you know, why are we doing this? Or there was so much that they didn't write down. Mm -hmm. And I just never, and I was only, I had a limited amount of time there and going through these documents takes forever. They would, they would, they would continue discussion, for example, about whether or not to disown someone for two and a half years. It had to be consensus. So, you know, every monthly meeting they say the committee could, was on, did not feel ready to report. The committee did not, get with the program. <laughs> How many of these do I have? Because you're trying to find out what happened to some of these people. So I'm sorry, no, I could, I mean, I, I keep thinking there's probably something there, but yes. Have you tracked any of the, the estate slaves that ended up in Hope up into the Canada or somewhere? But the, also in, just to, to the settlement in Hinesburg? No, I don't think there was one person uh, there who was probably a fugitive slave. Which one was it? Uh, I can't remember. It's in Elise's yeah. book. It's in. Right. Yeah. No, um, we don't. Here's the problem we don't have a last name, we have Jesse. 
and Simon, two, the two people about whom we have the most information through letters, and because of the letters, all of this information about Jesse's life in slavery. So, um, but you can't, he left, they both left. We, they did not stay, as far as, I'm quite sure they didn't. Um, but if you have no last name, you can't trace. Um, we had a couple that was sent up from um, Westchester County in New York, and their names were John and Martha Williams. Good luck <laughs> searching for John and Martha Williams. I didn't even try, because there will be 10 million John Williamses. Um, Jeremiah Snowden, that's a much more you know, catchy name, and I, and I searched that, but I, I couldn't find him. So, and sometimes we had no name at all. Um, so we, we don't know where they went. Yes? Uh, what year was this exactly? Uh, 1837. So, I mean, this postal, they, was it the U.S. Postal Yeah, oh yeah, it? yeah, I assume so, well, yeah. I, I don't remember penny postcards, I mean, how would it have cost to send this from Vermont and get it down to Carolina? That's a good question that I don't have the answer to. <laughs> I never checked. And was it a, a fear that uh, there would be, you know, bounty hunters that could come up and... Well, so this is an excellent example. One of... What? Okay. What did you say? Oh, there. Okay. Um, and I can't go backwards, can I? Um, Vermont was a relatively safe haven. Um, and this is one of the big points we make, and despite everything we do or did at Rocky Book um, Exhibition. Um, when you think of that map, which I didn't give you, we're, mm -hmm. we're at the northern end of it. You know, from Ferrisburg to Canada, even back then on a boat, wasn't, didn't take very long. You could get there in a few hours. So, and it, for somebody starting in the south to make that kind of a trip would have cost more than the value. And, and this really, it tends to be all about money. I mean, sometimes people were driven by emotion and other reasons, but it was a, it was a system of labor. It was, you know, um, it was how they made their living. And so they would go after people as long as it was worth what they were spending on. So um, I don't, we don't feel that people felt they had to go to Canada. Um, some fugitives who did go to Canada found that it wasn't very profitable. They couldn't find work. You know, it wasn't a whole lot better, and they came back. I, upstate New York, all over in upstate New York, there were um, formerly enslaved people living you know, quite openly. Um, Christiana, Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, sort of all over in the north. So it wasn't, no, and, and in all of the time frame, um, Ray Zerbos is an historian at, I, think, I don't know if he still teaches at, um, in Northfield at the university there. He did a report years ago called Friends of Freedom about the Underground Railroad in Vermont. And he tried to track down every single place that had been mentioned. And he found absolutely no indication that anyone ever crossed the border of Vermont trying to reclaim someone. And you can see, I mean, Jesse had this letter sent saying to Ephraim, here's where I am, come and get me, right? He, and he knew, he had to have known that that would not endanger him or he would not have done it. And well, he knew that Ephraim wouldn't have had the money. And there's no way Ephraim. And, and sometimes with, with these two men, you know, I think this is totally in my mind because I spent so much time you know, doing this research and thinking about them. I think of this Ephraim as kind of like, maybe didn't have a lot on the ball. And Jesse did. And the idea of spending his life working for the benefit of this guy who doesn't even have as much on the ball as he did was just galled him. There's a reason alone to skip out of her Quimmins and go somewhere else, right? Yes? It didn't, um, I know from my own research in Maine, yes. um, a lot of the freedmen of, um, that made the after the Civil War, or yeah. during the Civil War, yeah. Before, yeah. 1830s and oh, okay. 40s and 50s, went west into okay. Rochester, New York. Yes, yes, the upstate then, New York, upstate all over, New York. yes, yes. And then they could go to Ontario, right. where there were well, settlements. So, yeah, that's where the, you know, the, well, the other thing is from Vermont, you would, you'd be going up to Montreal, which did yeah. not have a big fugitive settlement community. They were in Canada West, which is now Ontario. Right. Um, 
the Elgin Settlement and the Dawn Settlement, and there are museums there in Buxton and a couple of other places where those people mostly lived. But it was not an easy life, and not everybody stayed. You had a question. Yes. Uh, I'm uh, perplexed in a way by the reality that here is a man who relatively is free. Right, exactly. And yet there's yes. something that has pulled him yes. toward his former owner. And yes. to get that piece of paper that gives him not additional freedom, well, but, but what? What is, well, what he gives him, him he, to that? Uh, well, I, we don't know. I mean, this is a question everybody asks. Why did he go to all this trouble? We don't know. He didn't, you know, he didn't leave us a note saying, here's why I did this. <laughs> but you can imagine, first of all, he's not legally free. Fugitives are technically to be, re under the Fugitive Slave Acts of 1793 and 1850, if you can catch them, we're happy. The government will help you take them back. So there is that little bit of risk. So in Vermont, you know, it wasn't that risky. But we don't know how he felt. You know, it's easy for us to say, as historians, 150 years later, well, there was no risk. He didn't know there was no yeah. risk, number one. Number two, it may have just been that important to him. He wanted to be free, not just almost free. And if he were challenged, if he left, which it presumably he did, if someone challenged him, he didn't want to have to, like, you know, have a freak out. And if you read, after the 1850, the second fugitive slave law, the couple of cases in Boston where it was just uh, crazy. The Shadrach Minkins, this, this mob, this mob of African Americans and white abolitionists just stormed the courthouse, grabbed him, dragged him out, and drove him to Montreal. That, you know, that was not something Jesse, you know, really wanted to have to deal with, I don't think. So, yes? Do we know from records back then how much a laborer would have been paid, like with 150? over that time, you know, like a skill, like a blacksmith or a um, I'm sure you can find that out. I didn't check artisan work. We haven't wrote the um, uh, records of, of farm laborers who worked on the farm. And I can, you know, I've looked at those. And a, a couple of people, William Clark, who was hired many years in a row for the whole year or the whole season, at least some years, made $120 a year. That was his stated annual pay. And he, made, he tended to make a little bit more than some of the other workers who only signed on during the hay season or for three months or somebody who came back every year because it was a very volatile market. Somebody worked for you one month, not the next, one year, not the next, one season, not the next, would be paid more because you want to keep them. So that's 120 to, you know, that the Robinsons paid to a white, local, regular farm worker. So how did Jesse save up 150? He had to have, first of all, saved every single cent mm -hmm. and worked there for a year at least, which is how we can calculate, you know. He disappears from the 1836 list of taxables. He had to make his way up to Ferrisburg pronto to have a whole year before March of 1837 when the first letter was sent. Mm -hmm. Yes? Were there any taxes that were ever put on a transaction involving the sale of slave? I understand that the revenue would come from, from a property tax when somebody would have a slave on the plantation and had to report all the property taxes. I don't know. You know that, would be, that would have been at the state or local level, and it would have varied, I suppose. Um, I have not read about that in all the readings that I've done. Um, that doesn't mean it never happened. I mean, definitely, you know, they were counted, slave workers were counted as part of the property. So if you, there was taxes paid at death or, you know, annually. Um, one of the hardest things for me has been to accept that a slave was was not a person in the eyes of the economic uh, uh, system at right. the time, but truly was property. Right. And so when you start thinking about property, you think, well, there's, there's, there's often, at least now, a tax whenever a piece of property changes hands. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I, I, 
think mm -hmm. sales tax and income tax are both 20th century inventions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a property, I don't think there, I mean, I, I, you know, I've read a ton and I've never come across it. So, it's interesting. Did, did you find that from Elliot on, on the census? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And so, and so there would have been um, real estate and personal yes. property. Yes. So what was his personal property? Um, well, if the personal property isn't on the, on the, on the list of taxable. Well, not that year? Uh, never. That, you know, they, they didn't yeah. count personal property. There would be land. And buildings and enslaved no, workers. Oh, census, census. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting the. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Um, I can't remember. Uh, okay. What I did was, um, be, when I was in North Carolina, I I I, walk, I went through everything in the archive about about Ephraim to the end of his life. I thought, I'm, and he, you know, it's really frustrating when you're trying to find out about an enslaved person. And you end up finding all about the white people, yeah. <laughs> you know. But I did look up everything I could find about Ephraim while I was there because I didn't want to miss the opportunity. Um, he did not do well. He did not prosper. He did not own more and more land. He did not have greater and greater valuation. And I was going to oh, I'm gonna, five seconds. What do I do? Well, that letter that was up, and I also can't go back. Oh, there. This is kind of flowery. If you could at all remember the letter that two, was two back, did not have this very flowery handwriting. Mm -hmm. How did Ephraim write these two very different letters? Mm -hmm. How is his penmanship completely different? Mm -hmm. He can't write. He's completely illiterate. Mm -hmm. He can neither read nor write. He, saw, he can't even write his name. All his documents are signed with an X. Mm -hmm. These letters were written by neighbors to whom he went mm -hmm. to have them write a letter for him. And at his death, his children could not write their names mm -hmm. on the documents when they were receiving their inheritance from him. They marked with an X. Mm -hmm. So Ephraim was not going anywhere. You know what I'm saying before? <laughs> he didn't have a lot on the ball. You know, it, it, it was shocking because in, in New England, in Vermont, everyone could write their name by like 1810. I mean, it, you know, people could definitely really write enough to sign their name and do some math and whatever. And the Quakers were intensely literate. And these were, you know, descendants of Quakers. How did they not learn this from their parents? I don't know. But Ephraim, you know, but he, um, I can't remember. I did check him out. I, I don't have any detail in my head about him. It's just shows. He did marry a woman named Mary Bliss. They had children. Um, but he never, you know, never he never owned another slave. He never was able to purchase another person to, you know, support him. Um, so, mm -hmm. just a, you know, middling little old North Carolina guy. That would explain why he didn't want to let him go. Well, absolutely. I mean, it, the letters are interesting because it's a mix of that money and his feelings for Jesse. He had, he clearly wants Jesse to come back, not just because he wants his labor. But because he wants his person, he wants his, you know his company. Um, not getting either. I mean, it's it's just so interesting the way those people thought. You know, can't believe he would offer himself so little. Right. Yes. Would, would a former slave need to have that, that letter to emancipation in order to buy property or something? No, no. Um, I'm trying to think of his name. Or the work. Uh, there, there. One of the one of the most important uh, fugitives. What's your name? He lived in he lived in upstate New York. He owned property. He was extremely successful. He married um, James Logan. He uh, James Logan. <laughs> um, he his he made a speech in 1850 when the second fugitive slave law was passed. It was in Syracuse. They had this gigantic protest meeting. And he made this absolutely wonderful speech, basically saying, here I am. I escaped, you know, in 18 whatever. Come and get me. I dare you. We're going to kill you if you try. It was a really wonderful, you know, radical, confrontational kind of speech. He owned property, and, and they never came after him. I mean, nobody showed up on his doorstep. So there were people like that all over. Um, in New York and Massachusetts, and not so much in Vermont, but um, yeah. The farther away from a 
centers of civilization, quote unquote, you were, the safer you were. That's and why yes. northern, northern Maine also yes. had a whole bunch right. of, it was the source of a number of abolitionist right. societies. The right. Earliest. Right. And um, that's, you know, the farther away from Boston or New York or Philadelphia or all Yeah, all, all, the, then that mm -hmm. big roundup, there would be roundups all over after 1850. Right. 1850 law. They were, those were all in the cities, Boston and New York and Philadelphia, um, partly because there were huge African-American populations. There. The African-American population in the North, the free population, was massively centered in the cities, uh, which is one reason why Vermont always had such a small black population. There was no city center. There was no you know, big place where there was a church and a community and where you could just kind of disappear and nobody would notice you. Um, although they did notice quite a few <laughs> after that law got passed. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, no, just they would go, they, would, they, they wanted to show that they meant it with the law. And what? That they were going to return fugitives to their owners. Oh. Um, there was, first there was a Shadrach Minkins. They were particularly keen to get Boston because it was the center of radical, radical abolition. They, they, so Shadrach Meekins was the first guy they found, and he had only been there like six weeks. He was working as a waiter. Some slave catcher came up from the South, and they had a description. It was somebody who had known him. I don't remember the details, but they found him. They got him into the courthouse, and then just whammo, they grabbed him out. It was great. Um, then there was Thomas Sims, and they were ready this time. Um, because they knew what was going to happen, that if they didn't really have him under lock and key and extremely well guarded, those same people would come back. And I think he, he, he got put onto a ship and he jumped into the water. And did someone pull him out? I can't remember. The, they finally succeeded with Anthony Burns. They got Anthony Burns. They really had him well protected. They called out like 20,000 federal militia to line the streets in Boston to take him down to the harbor to put him on the boat. So what the abolitionists in the black community did was they raised the money to purchase him, to say to the owner, OK, 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 you want him, we'll pay you. But he refused to sell. He wouldn't do it. So, they, so Anthony Burns was returned from Boston. And then it all kind of died down. I mean, that law caused such a furor in the months after passage. And then it just seemed like, oh, they said, okay, we made our point. You know, we're, and then after that, it was very little, it wasn't much of a, um, and, and, it, and it really backfired. It was part of that compromise of 1850 demanded by the South that, that the federal government would take seriously its responsibility to return these people. It so enraged Northerners that middle of the road kind of tepid anti-slavery people became raging radicals. They got so mad because for one thing, they, they were, if you, if you knew about some, a fugitive and you didn't report it, you could be sued or fined or there was some you know, citation, whatever, that you could get. So people were just crazy mad and it really built the anti-slavery um, sentiment in the country. It built the organizations. It, that last decade when things were getting worse, you know, practically every day leading up to the war, um, it, it, was, it was a boon for the abolitionist side, not for the other side. Sorry, I do go on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. It's, it's in support of people who, specifically, uh, people who know that in our ancestry there was labeled. So although there's some members of this who don't actually know, but it's a, a lot of people are from Central Vermont, but there have been those people who like, when COVID happened, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> So but anyhow, it's it's a few months a month, and it's, it's really a, a pretty interesting That's great. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing topic. And I will say also this about Vermont. Um, I did a bunch of research on uh, African Americans down on Addison County, where Wilkie is located, and two adjoining towns that were that are, were very close to Harrisburg. 
And I thought, all right, well, I'm going to give this a shot. Because people would come to Rope Beer, you know, tour us or tour the house, whatever. And they would ask us about, you know, the black folks who lived here. I had nobody written about it. There was very little information. And I kept thinking, well, somebody's going to write a book. You know, something will happen. And it didn't, and it didn't, and it didn't. I thought, oh, well, I'm just going to do this. Mm-hmm. And I figure it could all be over in two weeks, right? I won't find anything, and then that will be that. That was, that was like 2005, and I'm still, <laughs> I'm still doing that work. And of course, every time you go back to Ancestry or Google or whatever, there's new documents, there's new information. So if you're thinking about researching any of this, do, because you'll just be late. Do you have a book in the No, I don't. Um, I, I did, I did that bit, and then I then I got too busy at the museum. We were raising money to build the center that we built, and put this exhibit up, and um, and I have gone back to it, but um, I did, I just couldn't face doing the whole state. Um, so I, there was a wonderful the University of Virginia had the library at the University of Virginia on their website had these maps. They were absolutely fabulous. It was a county by county color-coded map of how many black people lived there at each decade, from 1790 to 1870, probably. So I looked at all of those, and I figured out that the majority of black Vermonters lived in this county is going up the west, Bennington, Rutland, Addison, Chittenden, Franklin, and Windsor on the other side. And I concentrated on those. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's good, every once in a while, I find somebody you know in Memorial County and God knows where, and I say, ah. <laughs> But you know, I can't because it's too time consuming. I still haven't gotten, you know, for me, I easily could do Chittenden, Franklin. I have to get to Rutland, I have to get to Bennington and Windsor, but you know, I can't drive back and forth in a day. Well, I could, but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, what I was, did in Addison, oh, on the other hand, I went into the town hall in every town. Any town that had a black person in any, one in any census, I went. And that's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to finesse getting to those farther mm-hmm. afield places. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting because what I'm finding is even in rural Vermont, the people tended to be living in whatever the town, the largest urban-ish-like area. Like in, like in Franklin County, they were one deck, one census, they were all in the same moment. Although I think that was a, I think that census takers played hooky sometimes. <laughs> I don't know what they were doing. <laughs> um, you know, and, in, and in Rutland, they were mostly in Rutland, and in Bennington County, they were mostly in Bennington. So you can see that even in a rural area, there was this pull to you know a more urban, as you, you call it that. I am not sure. I, you know, it probably. I mean, because it was a rural agriculturally based economy, there was work for farm laborers, and there were plenty of farm laborers. I don't get me wrong, there were, but people tended to live in towns. And in St. Albans, amazingly, there were tenants built in St. Albans. Um, I couldn't believe it. I mean. That all the black people lived on North Main Street by like 1850, 1860. You can see where they lived. And then in 1870, after the railroad came, the railroad moved to St. Albans in 1870, and the town went kabunga. They all lived in these tenement buildings at the corner of water and the four of them. I mean, I went through the city directories. Virtually the entire black population moved into these buildings which were torn down in 1919 because they were considered sub, uh, anyway, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.